Hi everybody, it's Mrs. Malloy yet again, and this is lecture number three for unit 5A, the Protestant Reformation and Counter-Reformation. Hey, did you know that one-fifth of the world's Christians today are Protestants? Huh? What's a Protestant? Exactly. So today we're going to find out. So during the latter stages of what we now call the Renaissance during the 1500s, movements like Christian humanism, as well as frustrations with the church, are going to boil over into a conflict, amongst Christians at least, who disagreed about church teachings. Yes, we are going to see various individuals beginning to question the church's practices and power over people's lives. This questioning is going to eventually spark massive reforms within the Catholic Church, as well as give rise to new Christian denominations. Yeah, you ever wonder where Presbyterians come from? Yeah, think about that every day. What about Baptists? What about Lutherans? How about Episcopalians? Yeah, well, by the end of this lecture, all will be revealed. La! Cue the heavenly trumpets right there. Yes, so the word Reformation looks and is spelled like reformation, right? The word reform is in it, but it's pronounced Reformation. So listen up to your social studies nerd teacher, or one day the Reformation will come up in conversation with a colleague and you'll say something like Reformation by mistake, and then they'll be like, um, it's Reformation, and then they'll mysteriously stop asking you questions about history because they think you're really dense and totally non-intellectual, and they'll whisper about you behind your back about your lack of knowledge, and they'll be all judgmental and stuff. So, so listen up. It's Reformation, okay? So, why was there a Reformation? Hmm. Well, quite frankly, many people took issue or had problems with how things were being done in the church. Let's make a list together of some of the issues that people had with the church, shall we? Number one, Renaissance ideas and thinking, like humanism, will inspire people to question the church. Number two, the printing press spread these types of ideas. Number three, King started questioning church practices because they didn't buy into the too legit, too legit to quit, hey, hey, mentality. Yeah, sing along. Number four, people couldn't relate to the Pope anymore. He was some distant figure, and face it, there was no Pope mobile back then or live video streamed mass. Number five, kings didn't want to share their wealth with the church, just like all of you don't want to share your cookies with your younger siblings if you can help it. Number six, rich merchants, hey, they didn't want to share their wealth either with the church. Number seven, some of the church leaders and officials had actually become quite corrupt, like some of them had families, uh-oh, amongst other things, against church policy at the time. And that doesn't even begin to explain what some of the priests or clergy members were doing, including some of the popes themselves, it is alleged. All right, and finally, the final problem, something called indulgences. What are those? Remember our classroom activity in which you all, well, you bribed me to give you good grades? Yeah, what are these things, indulgences? It's basically the theory that if you paid the church enough money, that they would forgive you of your sins. Hmm, total conflict of interest, right? Okay. Well, many early reformers of the church who spoke out against such issues, the ones I've just mentioned in our list of eight things, a lot of these people were put on trial, excommunicated, labeled as blasphemous, and they were often burned at the stake. So you can only imagine the number of people who never had the guts to speak out about these things, right? One priest from Wittenberg, Germany, and by the way, that sounds like and is pronounced Wittenberg, but it's spelled and looks like Wittenberg. Go take some German. Anyway, one priest from Wittenberg began to question the church. This man was Martin Luther. And no, he wasn't trying to branch off from the Catholic Church. He was totally devoted to the church. He's just one of those people who had the courage to speak out against the problems that he saw. In fact, in 1517, he nailed a huge list of his complaints about the church to the Wittenberg Chapel door. This list was known as the 95 Theses, or Theses, sorry. And yes, you need to write that down, 95 Theses. Amongst the 95 things he felt needed to be reformed, well, 
He didn't like that people could simply pay money to the church and be forgiven of sins. Those were indulgences, remember? The practice had, beco had become so rampant or widespread in the church that certain priests, like Johann Tetzel, tra traversed the countryside, advertising to people that if they threw money in a jar, they would be saved. Actually, the supposed quote or couplet that has been attributed to Tetzel was something along the lines of, quote, As soon as a coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. Now, not sure if he actually said that, but the bottom line is that Martin Luther objected to this practice because he felt that it ruined the whole concept of being forgiven by God, which he felt was a far more personal relationship between God and man. Luther's objections to indulgences and other church issues were spread by the printing press, of all things, and pretty soon people started to take notice. Luther is credited with having started the Reformation. Luther had several main beliefs or teachings. Number one, people should be saved by faith in God alone, not by faith and good works, as the church had taught. Secondly, Luther believed that church teaching should be based on the words of the Bible, and people should learn to interpret this for themselves, and not just depend on a priest's interpretation. And that brings us to his final complaint, or several teach his final teaching, was three, priests shouldn't be the ones intervening in a personal relationship with God. Later, Luther was asked to recant his beliefs by Pope Leo X, under threat of excommunication. And when Martin Luther refused to recant, he was excommunicated. Luther was forced to go to a city in Germany called Worms, spelled like Worms, but again pronounced with a V. He was commanded to take back his words. He refused and was labeled a heretic. A heretic is a person who holds beliefs that are different from the church. Luther was later sheltered and kept safe from church officials who wanted him burned at the stake. He eventually began a movement that became known as Lutheranism. Again, Luther hadn't wished to cause a widespread revolt or rejection of the church. He simply wanted reforms. For instance, when a large group of peasants in the German countryside began widespread protests against the church, in which they burned down churches and killed priests, Luther actually encouraged German princes to punish the people who were doing this. Consequently, many peasants felt betrayed by Luther, and they stuck with Catholicism in parts of what we now call Germany. And this, amongst other reasons, is why you will see uh, groups of Catholics in Germany today. Um, but it was also caused by another event that we're going to get to later. Now, what we call Germany now was actually a region with many different states. Each German state was led by its own prince. Some princes chose to stick with Catholicism. Other princes began to support Luther and his teachings, and new churches began popping up within these states. German princes who rejected the Catholic Church became collectively known as protesters against the church, or what we now call Protestants. This is all going to boil over into warfare amongst the various German states, Yes, <laughs> who knew that religion could spark conflict, right? <laughs> okay, that was just snarky. Let's move on. Finally, all of the princes came to an agreement. Each German prince could decide what, which religion they wanted in their own territory. This agreement became known as the Peace of Augsburg. There is much, much more to the Protestant Reformation, believe me, but we don't have time to talk about it here. I'd like you to write down some other important Protestant reformers in addition to Martin Luther. These include a guy named Huldrych Zwingli, check your word list, from Switzerland, a man named John Calvin from France. Uh, John Calvin preached that God had already decided who was saved and who was not saved. This whole concept is called predestination. The religion that became based on his teaching became known as Calvinism. Calvinism was admired by a guy named John Knox, who then helped to establish what we, we call the Presbyterian faith. French followers of Calvinism were called Huguenots. That looks like Huguenots. Please refer to your word lists. Um, anyway, these Huguenots were often massacred for having beliefs that their kings did not agree with, if those kings happened to be Catholic, at least. Consequently, most Christians in France today are of the Catholic variety. 
Another Protestant group that emerged included the Anabaptists, who believed that people needed to be baptized once they were old enough to understand right from wrong. Anabaptists were persecuted, of course, and helped to influence eventual groups like the Mennonites, Amish, Quakers, as well as the Baptists. Another group of Protestants, of course, are Episcopalians. Yes, so let's talk about the Church of England. Now it's time for Henry VIII. See, we've already spoken briefly about him, and we've already learned that Henry wanted a son, badly. His first wife was Catherine of Aragon, who was from Spain and uber, or very, Catholic. She gave him a daughter named Mary. Henry, consequently, wanted to annul his marriage to her so that he could marry his mistress, Anne Boleyn. Um, the Pope refused to annul the marriage, so basically, Henry took care of things himself by starting his own branch of Christianity, by breaking away from the church under something called the Act of Supremacy, which made himself too legit to quit, hey, hey, without the Pope's blessing. Yes, it made him the head of the Church of England. He then married Anne, who gave him, yes, a daughter, Elizabeth I, who later ushered in the Elizabethan age, remember? Anyway, his marriage to Anne was rocky because she, of course, gave him a daughter and there were some questions of infidelity and she was eventually beheaded. His third wife was Jane Seymour, who produced a male heir, Edward. Unfortunately, she died two weeks after the birth of Edward and uh, Henry went on to marry three more times after that, but he didn't produce any more offspring, that we know of at least. After Henry died, his son, Edward, took over and kept Protestantism alive in England, the Church of England. He kept it alive. Then Edward died, and Henry's first daughter, Mary, who was super Catholic, just like her mommy, Catherine, took over and tried to once again make England Catholic. She had many Protestants executed, and she became known as Bloody Mary. Yes, that's where it comes from, folks. It's not just a disgusting beverage with salty tomato juice or a game that you play when the house is dark at a slumber party to freak people out. Yeah. Anyway, so after Mary died, her sister Elizabeth took over, and she returned England to Protestantism under the Anglican Church, which was further divided in the Americas. And that, my friends, is a brief, a very brief history of the Episcopalian faith. All right, so what was the church doing while all this Protestant Reformation was happening? Well, quite a bit, actually. The church fought back against the change, and this collective movement by the church became known as the Catholic Reformation, also called the Counter-Reformation. The church did institute massive change by establishing religious orders to protect education, or promote education, rather, and reforms. One example of this was Ignatius Loyola, who helped to establish an order within the Catholic Church called the Jesuit Order. And he, this was an order in which priests helped to spread education to the general public. So, hello, McQuay Jesuit. Yes, that's a school named after, in part, the Jesuits. The Jesuits also did missionary work around the globe and tried to stop the spread of Protestantism in Europe. Other church reforms during this time included making changes within the church to address the abuses that had been taking place, like indulgences. At the famous Council of Trent, which was this huge meeting that took place amongst church members, from 1545 to 1563, church leaders met to decide on massive change, and they came to an agreement on how to run the church. Overall results of the Catholic Reformation include positive changes to the church's structure, especially in terms of worldwide education. The church's restructuring, however, led to a general weakening of the church in politics, as kings in Europe claimed power over territories called nation states, uh, nation states pardon me, which set the stage for the development of what we now call countries. Alright, once again, thanks for listening, and bye.